What we need is not more medication, but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. This is Exposé, coming to you live from Lagos, Nigeria, every Monday on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook simultaneously. And I'm your regular host, Tony Akiyami. Don't, don't forget, what we need what is we not need more, medication, more medication, but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. Welcome to Exposé. I'm honored to be your regular host. My name is Tony Akinyemi. Our axiom in Exposé is what we need is not more medication, but more education, because we believe that the best prescription is knowledge. Before we share what we have for you today, I want to personally invite you to our 5F conference coming up in December 2020, December 18 to 20. In the middle of this program, the adverts will be shown to you. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram. Like us on Facebook and be a part of the 5F conference, addressing critical areas of our lives, our faith, our fitness, our family, our finance, and our future. We have great speakers lined up, anointed men and women of God to address those five critical areas. Two sessions on Friday, December 18, two sessions on Saturday, December 19, and then we round it up with the grand finale on Sunday, December 20, 9 a.m. Nigerian time. It's 6 p.m. on Friday, 4 p.m. on Saturday. Both days will be virtual, and then on Sunday to be in church as well as virtual. Keep it in mind, please block your diary. Help us invite your friends and neighbors to join us. What we're doing today is to attend to the questions that people have sent to us listening to the various episodes on cardiovascular health and hypertension. We have about six questions that came in, which we want to address one by one. It's always a pleasure to attend to your questions to also hear your testimonies, your praise reports. Today, somebody sent me an email and it made my day. The person told me how two years ago, he contacted me for a major health challenge that, you know, she didn't believe she could see the end of that problem. And it's been a two-year journey. When she contacted me, I encouraged her, I inspired her, I gave her hope under God, and I told her that if she would just follow those tips that I gave to her, along with prayer and faith, that she would be okay. And she began to follow those things, and then today she sent me her press report by email. We've never seen face-to-face. -face. I don't even know how she looks like. She has never met me face-to-face. -face. She told me that she'll be looking forward to meeting me face-to-face -face one of these days. And when I read that praise report of what God has done in her life, how her life has been transformed, it took two years for her to get to this point. But guess what? She never believed that she could get over it. But under God, by the special grace of God, by the special mercy of God, she got over it. And she's so excited and so pleased that she wrote me a lengthy email today. And in fact, she told me that I could read that email to the church that I pastor and tell it on the mountain. Tell everybody, let them know what God has done for me. Wow. I pray for her that that testimony will be irreversible, irrevocable. It will be permanent and it can only get better in the name of Jesus. So keep your questions coming. Keep your praise reports, your testimonies coming. You never can tell. Somebody will be helped. Somebody will be inspired. Somebody will be encouraged when they hear your stories and your testimonies. There are some of them who have experienced major transformations, improvements in their health, particularly in their cardiovascular health and indeed other areas of their health that I'll be inviting to come on this program to share their stories with you. And then also I'll be interviewing some experts 
to share their perspectives, their wealth of knowledge and experience with us so that we can glean from their experiences. Now, we want to expose, we want to unveil, we want to reveal secrets, tips that can help you to better your health and your wellness in your life's journey. So let me go straight to some of the questions we have today. We have six of them that we want to attend to. The first one says, Sir, what group is Amlodipin? Okay, I know where that is coming from. Uh, when I started sharing or teaching on cardiovascular diseases, I highlighted many of the health challenges or problems that can develop with the heart and the blood vessels. That was where I began from. And then I went ahead to articulate 10 major types of interventions or therapies or remedies that official medicine or orthodox medicine or conventional medicine, what we call allopathic medicine. That's the medicine that we're familiar with in our hospitals and clinics around the world. When you go to a teaching hospital, a general hospital, you see doctors, you see pharmacists, you see nurses, you see physiotherapists, you see all kinds of, you know, laboratory scientists and all kinds of healthcare professionals. All of those put together practice what we call allopathic medicine, what many people call orthodox medicine. And so I shared with you 10 modalities that are deployed by allopathic medicine to address cardiovascular problems. I give examples of different types of pharmaceuticals that allopathic medicine uses or allopathic doctors use to address hypertension in particular. And then I mentioned uh, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, uh, AC inhibitors, statins, uh, you know, sedatives, and so on and so forth. So I think this person who is asking this question now Maybe he or she is on the drug amlodipine, and he or she wants to know which of those categories of drugs does amlodipine belong to. Amlodipine, by the way, is also called Novask. For some people may not know that the Novask they are taking is actually amlodipine. Amlodipine is actually a calcium channel blocker. That is the simple answer for that. It's a calcium channel blocker. Now, I go to the second question. Please, sir, I want to know more about that of the pressure of the eye and what to do. Again, in the course of my presentations, previous episodes in this series, I mentioned glaucoma. And I particularly refer to it as hypertension of the eyes, when there is too much ocular pressure. In other words, too much pressure in the eyes when the eyes have high tension or hypertension in the eyes. That's called glaucoma. Okay, that's the most common type of glaucoma. Now, um, there is fluid in the eyeball. And that ocular fluid, you know, makes the eye to be the shape that it has, not collapsed. That pressure can be too much. And when that pressure is too much, it typically begins to damage the optic nerves. The optic nerves are the nerves that connect the eyes to the brain. So you see the eyes are organs right here. Then we have the brain in the skull. Then there are wires, so to speak. They are called nerves, optic nerves, that connect the eyes to the brain. So that whatever the eyes see, the signals are transmitted through the optic nerves into the brain for interpretation so that you, you, you can interpret the image, the color, anything that you are seeing. So the brain and the eyes work in tandem. They work in collaboration for us to see. Now, when there is too much pressure in the eyes, that's glaucoma. I won't go into details. There are different types of glaucoma, open angle glaucoma, blah, 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 blah. I don't think that should be of interest to you. <laughs> what you need to know is that glaucoma is too much pressure in the eyes and what you need to do to normalize that pressure in the eyes. I have a plan that I have developed that if you practice it, it's diet and lifestyle. Simple. Diet, lifestyle, and a few supplements. Okay, like beta-carotene, like vitamin A, 
like uh, omega-3 oil to nourish the nerves, like nerve formula or neuroven and things like that. And these things can help to normalize the pressure in the eyes. And then glaucoma is gone in 90 days, as short as three months. Typically, allopathic medicine, we want to do surgery or use eye drops to regulate the pressure in the eyes. But I have seen several people, multiple number of people, who have normalized their glaucoma or the, blood, the pressure in their eyes by simply adjusting their diet and lifestyle. I have developed a diet plan that I call the 30-day challenge, which is published in our newsletter number 15. And it's also chapter 7 in my book, How to Regain and Retain Your Health. It tells you 15 guidelines to follow on a daily basis for a 30-day period to see how your health changes and improves. If you have glaucoma, you just follow that plan for 90 days, 3 months, and then go and check your eye pressure again. You'll be amazed to see that things are normalizing. Because if you don't normalize glaucoma, if you don't normalize the pressure in your eyes, it can damage the optic nerves. Now, the optic nerves are like multiple wires, several wires connecting the eyes to the brain. It first of all begins to cut some of the wires, damage some of the nerves. Let's assume hypothetically now to simplify it, that there are 10 wires connecting this eye to the brain, 10 wires connecting this eye to the brain. Those are 10 nerves. By the time there's too much pressure in the eye, one wire can cut. One wire cuts here, remaining nine. That person has lost 10% of his vision, remaining 90%. If that person doesn't address the pressure, over time, another wire cuts, remaining eight. That person has lost 20% vision, remaining 80% vision. And gradually, the person continues to experience vision loss until it leads to irreversible blindness, at least as far as medical science is concerned. If that person regains their sight, it will have to be by the miracle of God. I believe in miracles. The miracles are not things that happen every day. They are things that we experience, you know, from time to time by the mercy and grace of God. Okay, through faith. Now, so, in order to prevent that from happening, you need to normalize the pressure in your eyes. The first part of a person's vision that is lost when glaucoma is impacting on a person's vision is what we call peripheral vision. Now, imagine that a person's eye sees this way, you see? If you are looking straight like this, you are seeing the thing directly in front of you, and then you have a V-shape of vision that goes like that. You are also seeing things this way, this way. But the vision in front of you is the sharpest. The ones by the side, which we call peripheral vision, is not as clear to you as the one that is in front of you. But when glaucoma sets in and begins to damage the optic nerve, you see the peri peripheral vision begins to get lost, and then the range of vision begins to close and close. After some time, the person loses their peripheral vision. They don't see things on the side. As I'm sitting here looking straight at this camera, I can see three, you know, lamps illuminating me. There's one directly in front of me. There's one here and there's one here. I can see the two by my side faintly, even though I'm looking straight at the camera. But I can see the one in front of me clearer than the ones by the side. So my Frontal vision, direct vision, is clearer than the peripheral vision. But if somebody's optic nerves have been damaged by glaucoma, then they begin to lose their peripheral vision gradually. So if you're looking straight and you can't see the things by your side, then maybe you're losing your uh, peripheral vision. So what do you do to know your status? Simple. Go and see your uh, ophthalmologist. That's your specialist eye doctor. Let them check your eyes. They have their tools to test your eyes and measure the pressure inside your eyes to know whether you have glaucoma or not. It's not something you can tell by yourself, even though there are telltale signs. For example, when people have serious glaucoma, you see they have red short eyes. Their eyes begin to really get red and what have you. But that's not just enough for you to diagnose yourself of glaucoma. You need to see a specialist, let them conduct their test, and let them find out precisely what is going on. And the moment you are uh, diagnosed as having glaucoma, you need to take steps to correct it. You can send me an email or send your question or request uh, on any of the platforms that you are watching from, whether on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, and we'll be very glad to respond to you. I can send you by email 
the little plan that I have developed for glaucoma, and I have seen more than 80% of the people who practice those simple dietary lifestyle and faith plans, they get normal again within three months by the special grace of God. The third question here says, is it bad to hear your heart beat while lying on your left side? Is it bad to hear your heart beat while you are lying on your left side? Well, it doesn't matter which side you are lying on, whether on the left side or on the right side, on your back, on your tummy. Ideally, you are not supposed to hear your heart beats with your own natural ears, except you are using a device, maybe a stethoscope or something like that. You are not supposed to hear your heart beats. If you're hearing your heart beats, maybe you're having palpitations, or maybe you're having a type of tinnitus that they call pulsatile tinnitus. Pulsatile tinnitus. Now, what is tinnitus? Tinnitus is ringing in the ears. And when the person begins to hear some ringing in the ears or sound in the ears or buzzing in the ears or things like that or popping in the ears, that can be caused by several factors. It can be emanating from the ear itself, if there's any kind of damage to the ear, infection to the ear, perforation of the eardrum, or any of such things, or trauma to the ear, that person can begin to hear sound. I remember there was a time I attended an event, a very large gathering, and they had these very large, loud speakers, you know, taller than human, human height, big, massive, and the thing was pumping out a lot of power, sound. And my seat where they seated me was directly in front of the speaker. And I was there morning till evening. I didn't realize the damage I was doing to my eardrum until the conference was over that day. And I got back home. And for the next couple of weeks, my ears, that particular ear that was facing the speaker was ringing. Ooh, for so long, I suffered. I mean, it was not, it was not, it was a terrible experience. It was my first time of experiencing firsthand the damage that loud sound can can have to our eardrums and our ear generally. That's why you see people who walk in noisy areas, they wear these things to block their ears. Whether at the airport, you see all those uh, guys that hold this thing in the hand and they control aircraft. When the aircraft lands and they want to pack them, you see, they, have, they wear these things to protect their ears. And people who also serve in areas, any environment where there's too much noise, you need to protect your ears. Otherwise, you can damage your eardrum. And that can create tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears. That's one source. A second source for tinnitus is when a person has uh, dental problems. Okay? Either problems to the, uh, the teeth, the gum, or the temporomandibular joint, TMJ, or anything that has to do with dental issue, that can also cause ringing in the ears. Because you see, the ear, the nose, the throat, the mouth, everything, they're all connected. So any problem, uh, certain problems rather, certain problems, dental problems, can lead to tinnitus. A third cause of tinnitus is brain issue. When there are things going on in the brain, Okay, particularly when the communication link, uh, the network of communication uh, where neurotransmitters are transmitted in the brain. We have the gray matter in the brain and you have the white matter. Okay, and uh, one is like um, your train station and the other is like the tracks that connect the train stations. Okay, so data is stored in memory, information is stored in memory. And then they are transmitted from point A to point B. When there's any modeling up of the transmission mechanism, neurotransmitters through the transmission channels, that can lead to tinnitus or ringing in the ears. So the ringing can be originating from the brain. It can be originating from the, 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 the buccal cavity, the mouth, uh, and the joints, the, the temporomandibular joint, that's TMJ. It can also be originating from the ear itself. Now, so... When a person begins to hear his own heartbeat, that is not normal. Like I said, it is called pulsatile tinnitus. It's a kind of tinnitus where your ear begins to hear the beating of your heart that it shouldn't hear ordinarily. You need to see your healthcare provider to diagnose, to investigate, diagnose, and give you uh, a remedy or a therapy towards that. Now, number four. It says, question number four says, what interactions might happen 
with other drugs I am taking. I also believe that this person is asking this question in relation to supplements, uh, particularly some of the supplements that I recommended for cardiovascular health, uh, hypertension, and the rest of them. How do these supplements and the food that we eat, the fruits that we eat, the vegetables and the smoothies and juices, how do they interact with our pharmaceutical drugs prescribed for us to address hypertension or other cardiovascular issues? I believe that is the question. And if that is the case, this is my answer. First of all, let me give you the first tip. The first tip is that I gave uh, a plan for liver detoxification and gallbladder cleansing in one of the eight strategies that I mentioned uh, in previous episodes, that you can use grapefruit juice along with uh, extra virgin olive oil, garlic, ginger, okay, and uh, lemon juice to prepare your liver gallbladder cleanse. Now, let me say first and foremost that grapefruits have been found to be highly reactive with so many things, whether they be pharmaceutical drugs or supplements, because they are high in the enzyme aromatase. Aromatase reacts with so many things. It is aromatase that converts testosterone to estrogen in men. That's why you see grandma will tell their grandsons not to take grapefruit. That it will feminize you. It will feminize you. Don't take it. Grandma may not have been able to explain the science of it, but that's precisely what happens. The aromatase enzyme in grapefruit juice, or when you juice your gra grape juice and you drink it, not grapes, but grapefruit. Grapes are the tiny, tiny little purple or green grapes that they used to make wine. But grapefruit is the citrus family. Bigger than an orange. Some of them are whitish. Some of them are purple in color. Okay, that's grapefruit, citrus. Now, the juice of grapefruit contains aromatase, and that aromatase can react with so many things. So, the general advice I will give is that if you are going to do that liver cleanse where you are using the grapefruit, make sure you do not take any supplement or pharmaceutical drug close to the time that you took the grapefruit. You allow a minimum of two hours gap. Ideally, if I was going to do a liver cleanse or God that I detox, that whole day, I do it for a 48 hour period, really. So for those two days, I will not take any supplement and I will not take any pharmaceutical during those two days that I'm taking that. I'm not recommending that for you, but I tell you that's what I do because I don't want the grapefruit to react with any other thing that I am taking. It does not react with everything, but it reacts with many things. And that's why you have to be careful in taking grapefruit alongside with your pharmaceuticals or your supplements. So that's the first guideline. The second guideline I will give regarding drug interaction is always consult with your healthcare professional before you combine different medications and supplements. Seek their professional and expert opinion. Don't do things if you are not sure of the implications. Number three guide that I will give in that regard relating to drug interaction is always allow two hours gap between when you take your pharmaceutical drug and when you take your supplement. Don't take them together at the same time. Don't take your amlodipine now. Well, you drink water. And then you take your hot tom berry. And then, well, you also drink water and go together. I'm not saying that the two of them will react, but it is safer for you to allow two hours between the two so that one of them has already been absorbed into your bloodstream, okay, processed and absorbed into your bloodstream before the next one will come. So the possible of interaction is eliminated or at least minimized. Okay, that's the third simple guideline that we give for that. So number one, avoid grapefruits along with your drugs or supplements. Number two, always seek the expert opinion of your healthcare provider, healthcare professional. And number three, if you must take them and you don't have any expert opinion to, 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 to guide you, make sure you allow enough gap, at least two hours, from the time you took one before you take the other. That is common sense. Question number five, it says, can you recommend a diet or eating plan to help me reach my ideal weight? Okay? Again, I have mentioned the fact that um, to know your ideal weight, you have to calculate your 
body mass index. In my last episode, I gave you the formula for that W over H squared, where W is your weight in kilograms and H is your height in meters. So you divide your weight by the square of your height, your weight in kilograms, your height in meters, and that gives you your BMI or body mass index. Your ideal BMI is 18.5 to 24.9. If your BMI is below 18.5, you are regarded as underweight. If your BMI is between 25 and uh, 29, you are regarded as overweight. If your BMI is from 30 to 40, you are regarded as obese. And if your BMI is above 40, you are morbidly obese. So this person is asking me to recommend a diet or eating plan to help reduce his or her weight. Now I have done a newsletter called Weight Management. You can actually order it on famila.com, familabooks.com. You can come to our bookshop and buy the hard copy or you can send me an email if you are not within reach of these locations and I can send you a copy, an electronic copy, Weight Management Strategies. And I have articulated there 10 simple strategies to help you manage your weight. But again, if you go on YouTube and you search out the 30-day challenge, I have presented it in a couple of places, particularly in some churches, you can pull out that video, the 30-day challenge, and just watch that video and listen to the 15 guidelines in that video. Everybody who follows those guidelines will definitely normalize their weight. So that's one good way to do it. Or you can just get my uh, healthy living newsletter on weight management. I'll give you a few tips today if you, before you, you access those uh, resources. One is to reduce the amount of cooked food that you eat, increase the amount of raw food that you eat. Raw foods don't make people gain weight. It is cooked food that makes people to gain weight. That's the first secret. You don't have to pay for that. It's free of charge. Now, the second secret, if you want to lose weight, is don't eat late. Stop eating latest by 6 o'clock. And then you see your fat melting away. Late night meals make you to gain weight. That's another one. Of course, the idea of exercise is also there. And so on and so forth. I prefer that you use these modalities to normalize your weight and to start looking for weight loss uh, supplements or things like that. Of course, there's a place for that if it becomes necessary. Things like chitosan, like, uh, like green beans, like um, apple cider vinegar, and so on and so forth are all helpful. You know, African mango, these things are helpful in accelerating your fat burn, increasing your metabolism to help you burn more calories. But those uh, basic non-pharmaceutical, non-supplement approaches like adjusting your diet, exercising, and so on and so forth are more rewarding. They don't just make you lose weight, they also benefit other, other aspects of your health. Your total, all systems in your body, your entire body from head to toe will benefit from those. If you are using supplements or medication or things like that, or you are doing liposuction, or you are doing surgery to bypass your stomach to, or to reduce the size of your stomach, those things don't benefit all the systems of your body. You just lose weight and lose weight and that's it. But when you do the appropriate things, you lose weight on the one hand, your cholesterol normalizes, your blood sugar normalizes, your blood pressure normalizes, your triglycerides will normalize, and all the health indices and the indicators of health are also normalizing. So there's an overall benefit that you get when you approach weight loss appropriately. And make sure you don't lose weight too rapidly. Otherwise, your body will be generating a lot of uric acid. And those uric acids, your body can only excrete a certain amount per day. If you are generating too much uric acid, far more than your kidneys can excrete from your system, then you have accumulation of uric acid and they start getting deposited by gravity to the lower extremities of your body. Your knees and then your toes and your ankles. And that's what gives many people gout or what is known as gouty arthritis. The arthritis that normally affect the big toes of the leg. More common among men than women. It's called gout, G-O-U-T, or gouty arthritis, G-O-U-T-Y arthritis. That's because of excess uric acid 
being deposited because of the way you are rapidly melting your weight, which is not a good idea to lose weight. It should be gradual over a reasonable length of time. I think this is a good place to have a break so we can talk about the 5F conference coming up December 18 to 20 again. I want you to join us virtual, online, on YouTube, on Instagram, on Facebook, and then on Sunday, December 20, during the grand finale. If you have the opportunity, please join us in our auditorium, 18 Shogunle Street, Abuli Bagbo, off Mobilaji Bank, Anthony Way, behind ATFS Places, between the co-hospital and Sheraton Hotel, Ikeja, Lagos. And it's going to be a wonderful time. We have Pastor Nia Desanya, who will be ministering on finance. We have Dr. Melody Akiyemi, who will be ministering on your fitness. We have uh, Pastor Kola Ulubodi, who will be ministering on your faith. And then we have Pastor uh, Deji Olabode, who will be ministering on your future. And we have Pastor Bisi Adewale, who will be talking about your family. It's, it's going to be a blast. I just don't want you to miss it. Now listen, I'll be back shortly. Welcome back. This is Expose, brought to you by the Shepherd's Flock International Church. It's always my pleasure and honor to be your host. My name is Tony Akiyami. Don't forget, what we need is more education and not more medication. For the best prescription is knowledge. Now I'm going to answer the last question for today, and we'll be done. The last question today says, please, how can white coat syndrome be resolved? Again, this is coming from one of the previous episodes that we've had. White coat syndrome refers to one of the different types of hypertension that people experience. Uh, white coat syndrome is a situation where you are not really hypertensive. You are not really hypertensive. But when you go to an hospital environment and you see people in white coats, you know, doctors typically will wear their white coats, you see nurses, you see pharmacists and all of that, when you see them in their white coats with stethoscopes around their neck, you become nervous, you know. That nervousness can drive up your numbers. It can drive up your blood pressure, particularly your systolic pressure. So when somebody gets to the hospital, you see, you begin to sweat in your palms. That means you are nervous and your BP goes up. When your BP momentarily goes up because of nervousness, when you enter a hospital environment, that is what is called the white coat hypertension or white coat syndrome. So somebody says, how then do you address that? Of course, that doesn't mean you're hypertensive. So obviously you don't need medication to treat it. What you need to do, number one, is to own your own blood pressure monitor at home, your own speak at home, so that you can check your own BP regularly. And if I check my BP before leaving home, in the comfort of my home, and the thing was 110 over 20, and then I got to the hospital, and then they checked my BP, and it's now 160 over 120, within one hour, I'm going to know that, well, I think I'm just nervous. That's why this thing went up like that. So I'll tell them to give me time, let me sit down and relax a little bit, maybe for 30 minutes for one hour. Okay, then now I say, okay, come and take my BP again. That's one way to know what exactly it is. So when you own your own blood pressure monitor, it helps you to track your own readings so that if you have that spike when you go to the hospital environment, you don't become concerned that something is wrong. Of course, you have to be sure that your BP monitor is properly calibrated and it's always reading correct readings. Occasionally, you need to compare. You can walk into, in Nigeria, it's so easy to walk into a pharmacist shop and they can take your blood pressure. Sometimes even in the airports, they have some of these machines there to check your BP for free or maybe for a token. I mean, that's in a relaxed environment. You are not tensed up, you are not nervous and all of that. That helps you to know your numbers and not to be worried when you get to the environment of the hospital and you find your BP going up. The second 
strategy I will leave with you is to always meditate on God's word. You see, the Bible says, Thou will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are stayed on you. Read it in Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. Anyone who, who keeps their mind staying on God, whose minds stay on God, their minds meditate on God's word, and they stay on the God of the word. The Bible says God will keep them in perfect peace. The peace of God that passes understanding will possess your soul. So anxiety is not there. Nervousness is not there. Worry is not there. So this kind of you know, spike in BP just because of nervousness is no longer your concern. Okay? And then there are essential oils that also help. Something like lavender oil. It's a very relaxing oil. You can put it in your car as a diffuser. You know, you have these diffusers. You can put lavender oil in them. Plug it into the cigarette lighter. The socket where your cigarette lighter is plugged into. Plug the diffuser in there and put lavender oil. So it begins to diffuse lavender oil into your car. Of course, you wind up and put on your AC so that you can inhale the lavender oil. It has anti-inflammatory effect. It has a calming effect. So even as you are driving to the hospital, you're already calm before you got there. So when they take your BP, it's not likely going to have the white coat syndrome showing up. You can also have a diffuser at home, by the way, to diffuse lavender oil. Then there's lavender oil now in capsule form, gel capsules that people can actually ingest. You can swallow it with water. And it can actually help to calm down your nerves and so on. Magnesium is also a very good calming mineral that will calm your muscles. Magnesium calms your muscles. It also helps bowel movement regularity. So you can take magnesium as a relaxant, muscle relaxant. Uh, there are magnesium drinks out there that you can mix into water and drink, mix into your smoothie or juice and drink, and they will calm you down. So when you get into that environment, you are not nervous. Okay? So this is how far we can go today. Again, I want to appreciate you for your time with us. It's been a wonderful episode today again. Don't forget, what we need is not more medication, but more education. And the best prescription is knowledge. I hope to see you again next month on the same platform for uh, Expose every Monday, 8 p.m. Nigerian time. And particularly... Accept this as my special invitation to you for the 5F conference, December 18 to 20, 2020. Friday, December 18, 6 p.m. Nigerian time online. Saturday, December 19, 2020, 4 p.m. Nigerian time online. And Sunday, December 20, 9 a.m. Nigerian time both online and inside our church auditorium. In fact, they will be transmitted simultaneously at all our TSF parishes, the Shepherd's Flock International Church. So you can go to any TSF parish near you and join other believers in that conference to stay together live, to be blessed as we talk about your faith, your fitness, your family, your finance, and your future. Be my special guest. And send me a note thereafter. Let me know your feedback. It is not just a conference. It is an encounter with the living God and the word of God. And your life will transform for the better, for the glory of God, for your joy and your fulfillment. Thank you once again. Bye-bye.